All right, lecture seven, quantum circuits. So now we'll, we'll actually start talking about quantum circuits. This is going to be the introduction to the quantum circuits. And, um, and I'm going to start with giving you an example of a quantum circuit and uh, application. And then I'm going to go back uh, and then start to talk a little bit about classical circuits and then go to the quantum circuits at the end. And it's going to be an introduction. Uh, so I want to have a motivation, start with a motivation. And some of the things may not be, some of the elements of the circuits may not be clear, but the, by the end of the lecture, I hope to get to the end or describe these things. So one of the motivations for this uh, quantum algorithms or for quantum circuits is uh, one application is search algorithms. And in the most basic sense, uh, search algorithm is, the search problem is the following. You have a set S and you have a function from the set to the real, so it could be something else. And the problem, the search problem is given y in the reals, find an x naught in the set so that f of x naught is equal to y. Essentially, you have a set S and you're searching for a specific element, x naught, that gives you y. Uh, you can think of this as an inverse problem, taking the inverse of a function. Uh, the, in the most general case, you're not guaranteed that there's going to be a unique solution. They could, there could be multiple solutions, so even inverting it might be difficult and it might be uh, complicated. So oftentimes, for search problems, instead of trying to find the inverse of the function f, the one of the strategy is to just search for x0, and it's just try all the elements until you find the solution. And it's a, a problem where you can just check, guess and check. So that's essentially a search algorithm. And the search algorithm are different ways to guess, which it could be in a systematic way. And the people want to optimize how to best guess. And, and they get a simple example. And then there's like, you can have more structure in S and F, and then that could, you can tailor your search algorithms that way. And in some cases, you have so much structure that you don't really need to guess. You can invert the function. Uh, one specific example is uh, roots of a polynomial. And for instance, my function, I can take a quadratic x squared plus bx plus c. And y, the value that I want the function to take, equals 0. Then in this case, we know that we have two solutions. And this is going to be the solution to the problem. And in, uh, in the example that I'm going to look, that we're going to look at, this is a fairly simple example. Um, it's going to be a quantum search algorithm. And here, the uh, Hilbert space is just three copies of C2. So the basis vectors are going to be given by these elements, uh, uh, sequences C1, C2, and C3, where CI is either going to be 0 or 1. You can think of it as spin up or spin down, and, but most, most of the times in the quantum uh, computing literature, it's just 0 or 1. And in here, for each of the basis elements, I identify it with a binary number. Um, so in here, uh, since this is these are all zeros or ones, this I can this corresponds to a binary a number in base two, c one, c two, c three. Um, so if I given this identification, the set that I have of the different elements is gonna be of size eight, zero through seven. And in here, I'm just going to take a very simple function for my search algorithm. And it's going to be, uh, I arbitrarily chose the number three. I'm uh, 
uh, and my function is gonna be one at three and zero everywhere else. And I guess I didn't write the problem, but the problem here is find x and s so that f of x naught is equal to one. So in here, we already know the solution, but this is just a proof of concept. So we're looking for three for this function, for this specific search problem. And the goal in the, for the quantum search algorithm is to actually find a unitary operator, a quantum operator that is going to take the Take the element zero zero zero, so just some fixed initial condition that is chosen arbitrarily, and it's just zero zero zero, and then it's gonna spit out the solution. And it turns out that you, it's difficult to spit out the exact solution, so instead you want to you wanted to spit out the solution with high probability. So. In this case, we want to find that if we apply the operator u to the initial condition zero, zero, then the probability of measuring three is high. In the binary notation, three is gonna be one, one, zero. So after applying u, this is going to be our, this is going to be, we want this to be a high probability, so a probability close to one. It's actually, and in practice, may not be that close to one. It could be like three-fourths, something like that, but that's going to be good enough. Um, so this is the idea of a quantum search algorithm. Obtain an operator that you take this arbitrary initial condition, which we assume it's going to be zero, 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 and then spits out the solution. Any questions? All right, so for this specific case, I have the algorithm here. Uh, there's different components to this algorithm, and this is my quantum circuit. And I have the zero, so you, you can see the, the quantum bits, the qubits. They're going to be q0, q1, q2. And q3 is going to be an additional qubit that I needed for computations, but the solution is encoded in the Q0, Q1, Q2. Um, and then the function where that is equal to one if it's three and zero otherwise, actually in this case it's not equal to three, but I'll, I'll change it in a bit. It's uh, given by this diagram in the middle here, this, is act this actually corresponds to a function that we're interested. In. And then the rest of the um, circuit is actually the computation that's gonna spit out the solution. So in this case, you can see that the solution here, the probabilities of the different outcomes are represented in this bar graph. And we see with high probability, one of the elements is is picked out, is chosen. And this is gonna spit out the answer to my quantum algorithm. Um, so in here, I can actually, uh, so in here, this is, like I claim this uh, section. Uh, what can I do? No. Oh no, what did I do? Let's close it. Let's do this. I wanted to, no, what did I wanna do? I don't know what I wanted to do. Uh, let's delete this and just bring one of these bad boys here. So this section is what is computing my f, my function that's indicating the solution or not. And depending on how I move these elements, it's gonna change my f. So here I can actually construct uh, an arbitrary f for the set zero through seven and it's gonna spit out different solutions. Nope. Uh, 
So, and then I can delete this guys. So based on the, on this part of the circuit, on this function that indicates the solution or not, then this algorithm is gonna give me the solution. It's gonna spit out the solution. Um, so actually, what do I wanna do? I think the solution that I'm looking for, let's get, uh, that's not it. I should actually, and no, it actually has two zeros and delete, delete. I think this is it. Zero, so the first one is just, they're all gonna be one, it doesn't matter, and then this is zero, zero, one. So I think that's it. Uh, I forget if I need to read it backwards or forwards, but essentially this is my function that uh, gives me one when it's three and zero otherwise. So this is gonna be an example of a search algorithm. Um, and this section that determines the f function is sometimes it's called an oracle, and it's kind of like a black box thing that kind of computes whether you're in the solution or not. So this is a specific example, and this is what we're gonna be looking at. And throughout the lecture, I'm gonna to try to describe some of these components of this uh, circuit. But just to, to give you an idea of how things work. Any questions? All right, so this is the quantum, the IBM quantum, where you can just draw the, your quantum circuits. All right, so let me take a step back and actually go through classical computer circuits and the and in here I take a specific definition of uh, a, a computer circuit, which is the which is how I'm going to generalize the definition from a circuit to a quantum circuit. And its basic essence is that a computer circuit is going to be a function from this set of zeros and ones to this sets of zeros and ones, and this set of zeros and one is just a sequence b1 through bn of zeros and ones. And in here it's also just a sequence of zeros and one. And each bi is gonna be a zero or a one, and each element of the sequence bi is called a bit. So this is the essence of a computer circuit. And in for um, the case where we have uh, low n's, small n's, and m is equal to one, then we're familiar with some of the diagrams for the different types of circuits. In n equals one, we have the identity circuit, with the map, where it just maps zero to zero and one to one, and this you're represented by a wire. So it's electricity going from A to A, so nothing is changing. And this is gonna be the identity. Uh, Another map that you have is the not map, which flips the bits from zero, one, and one to zero, and this is gonna be the gate representation for it. And then your, I suspect that you guys are all, all familiar with this type of gates or you've seen it in passing, but I'm just introducing them for completeness. For n equals two, we have the or gate, that's the, if either, a or B is equal to one, then it returns one. So this is the map. And we have a few more. We have the XOR, where it's the sum of the bits modulo two. We have the AND gate, which if A and B are one, then it returns one. We have the not AND gate, the NAND gate, which is the negation of the AND gate. And we have the NOR gate, which is the negation of the OR gate. And it's just the AND and OR gates and you just add a little circle in the front. And these are some of the circuits that we have. Now I have a question for you. How many distinct maps, or you can call circuits, 
do you have for n equals 2 and m equals 1? And then I would try to generalize that to n equals n, so for any n and a fix m equals 1. And then generalize that for any n, any fixed n and any fixed m. So I'll give you a few minutes to work on it. And let's see how far you can get. And in particular, did I already show all the circuits for n equals 2? I showed some, but did I show all of them? I, I, for n equals 2, I showed some. Are these all of them? Am I missing any? So that's the first question. How many are there? Feel free to consult with your neighbor. terms of gates, I'm thinking about it just maps. Oh, just from general maps? Yeah, B1, B2 maps to 0, 1. Oh, okay. Yeah, because like, that's the abstraction of a circuit. It's just a map from, in this case, it's a map from sequences B1, B2 to um, the set uh, 0 or 1. Oh, we're doing two goals? Oh, well, n equals 2. For, for the um, for the function map, like the codomain, or sorry, the domain. The, for the domain, it's going to map, I mean, the domain is going to be, for n equals 2, it's going to be sequences of two bits. Oh, okay. B1, B2, and it's going to either map to 0 or 1. Mm -hmm. So this is what we had here. As you can see in this, in this example, see, this are, these are all the sequences of uh, two bits, and they map to either zero or one. Mm -hmm. So it's this type of maps. How many are there? And then the generalization is, if it's a sequence of n bits that map either to zero or one, how many are there? Mm -hmm. And then after that, if it's a sequence of n bits that map to m bits, how many are there?
M is not necessarily strictly smaller than N. Uh -huh. The okay. M could be larger. It could be N is equal to one, and M could be three. Mm -hmm. We want to build all the circuits ever possible. All right, just to do a uh, warm up, if n is equal to one and m is equal to one, how many are there? Four? I think so. Is that what everyone gets? Four possible combinations. Yeah. Four. Uh, what did you guys get for? this case, n equals 2 and n equals 1. Any answers? 8. 8. Any other answers out there? All right. Let's move on. How about n equals n and m equals 1? Do we get a consensus on this one? 2 to the n plus 1? 2 to the n plus 1. 2 to the n plus 1. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Is everyone okay with that? And, uh, and for the last one? Two to the n plus n. So for each bit b1, bi, you're going to have, uh, for this one, you're going to have uh, you're going to have two to the m solutions, two, 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 two to the m, so for each bi, you can map to uh, 2 to the m options, and then you multiply times that. Um, that sounds about right. I actually did not do this ahead of time. I uh, left this to be a, uh, in a problem that we can do together. But I was interested in one particular result in particular, is that they're all finite. And I'm sure we can all agree on it. Counting is not necessarily my strongest suit, but, and oftentimes I'm just happy to show that things are finite. But I think we can all agree that these are all finite maps. And this is the important lesson. And this is what I want to get to. This is the claim. Um, well, we can actually, classically, we can construct all the circuits, potentially. We can enumerate them at the very least. Uh, if we if n and m are fixed, we can construct them all and we can enumerate them. And moreover, we can actually construct them by stacking gates, like Forrest uh, suggested that you stack gates to construct other circuits. And we actually just need this three gates and we can construct all the circuits just using this gates. And this is a universality result, that if you can construct these three gates, then you can construct any circuit. At least for, in here I'm taking the version where m is equal to 1, uh, but for higher m, you should be able to convince yourself that you can do it also. That there's a universal set of gates where you can construct any other gate using this universal set of gates. So, and we'll see... Eventually, we'll see the uh, analogous result for the quantum case. But let's look at the proof for this result. Uh, in here, my, I have a function, and I want to, or my circuit f, which is a function that I want to build 
by stacking these different gates. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, this function that has n plus one bits, and we want to build it from uh, by stacking gates, and we're using induction, so we assume the result to be true for uh, n bits, and we introduce the these two functions. We given this f, we define two functions of n bits f sub k, which we just evaluate f, the first bit to be k, and then the other ones are free variables, and k is either 0 or 1. So in here, in this circuit, you have f0, which means that you put 0 in here, or f1, which means that you put f1 in here. Um, and in here, this is a diagram from the textbook. You, this is the proof. This is the circuit that would do it. So we assume that we, we already have the circuits built by stacking these different gates, and we just stack those other gates again. And we can actually follow this proof. It's not too difficult. So for instance, if, the, if this is x, if x, if the bit x0 zero is zero, then what we want the output to be is going to be f0, x1, and so on, x, n, which is just going to be f0 of x. This is the result that we want. And we can actually track this. Um, this is going to be 0. And regardless of what f1 is, this is going to be 0. And then in here, this is going to be 1. And I forgot to mention for classical circuits, this diagram here is that it's copying, this is called a fan, fan out operation, where you can, uh, if you have a wire, you can like split the signal in two. You can just take electricity. So I guess in here I should do the fan out. So it takes a bit X, B, and then it spits out two copies. This is the fan out operation. Fan out. And so we have one, and then in here we have, this is gonna be F0 of X. And then this operation, F, if this is one and this is F0, then the value of this is just gonna be the va whatever value F0 is. It's gonna be one, times F0 of X. And then with the XOR operation, it's gonna be zero plus F0. So this is gonna be F0. And we're gonna obtain, if the bit X0 is equal to zero, then the result is gonna be F0. And then you can actually do the same uh, analysis for the other case. We can do it quickly. So the goal for this case, if this is one, we want this to be equal to F1. And this is going to be zero, zero, and one, F1, F1, F1. So this circuit is gonna give us either, it's gonna give us F, and just by stacking this gate. Questions. So this is a nice result to kind of like see how you can build everything from a basic number of gates. Yeah. What are those like boxes with the like that are computing the functions? Yeah. So this is the induction step. So so since this are going to be so this is a circuit with n plus one bits. So this one's, we assume they exist. We don't know what they are, but by induction, you can like start building them. Okay. So now let's move on to the quantum circuit.
and I take an analogous definition to the classical circuit. And in here, what I had before was a map from the bit space to another bit space. And here, I'm going to take a unitary map from our Hermitian space to the Hermitian space. And in here, typically, the Hermitian space is just going to be uh, different copies of C2, up or down spins, zeros or ones. And um, in here, the basis of this, of this uh, Hermitian space is going to be uh, this tensor products of zeros and ones. So a typical element in here is going to be um, 1, 0, 1, or a typical basis element, something like this. Let's put this zero. So it's just going to be a sequence of zeros and ones, kind of like the bits where a sequence of, of zeros and ones. And here the basis for this Hilbert space is going to be a sequence of zeros and ones. So it's going to have the same, the basis is going to be created by the bits of length n. And here, each element or coordinate in this tensor product, it's um, called a qubit. And it's represented by a point on the block sphere. So again, we have that, we have this condition that, so this is gonna be one of these elements in the, of our, of our Hilbert space, one specific coordinate. And we have the condition that the norm has to equal to one. And that means that you can actually write it explicitly in this, as this linear combinations with some parameters, theta, phi, and gamma. And yeah, I think that's it. Theta, phi, and gamma. I feel like I need one more parameter, but I think that is it. Anyway, so <coughs> you can write it in this format, which then suggest that this, first of all, this element, um, this is just gonna be a phase factor, and it's not gonna change the probability. So this element is often drop in the represent in this representation. You don't see the parameter gamma because it's not gonna change the probability. So people just represent the they represent the uh, the point by just the coordinates theta and phi, which you see here, theta and phi. And for me, the, to see that actually you can represent a qubit as an element on a two sphere, on a two dimensional sphere in, in three dimensions, for me it's easier to actually look at this condition uh, where I have that the coefficients, the norm square have to be add up to one. And if I break it up into the real and imaginary components of each of the number, each of the parameters alpha and beta, I can write it coordinate wise this way. And by doing a phase rotation, I can actually assume that this alpha is completely real. So I can assume that this is equal to zero. And then I have that the equation alpha r squared plus beta r squared plus beta i squared is equal to one. And this is the equation for a point on the two sphere. And then you can take this representation and write it in terms of polar coordinates. So for me, I like to see the Cartesian coordinates, and then I know that I can change the polar coordinate to polar coordinates. So you'll see that specific qubits are going to be represented as elements of uh, as uh, elements of this block sphere, which is a two sphere. Yeah. So are you saying that each element 
of like that uh, Hilbert space that you had on the previous page is mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. So in here, you see that it has different components. Uh, this uh, tensor product, you have E1 at 3EN. And when I look at a specific qubit, I'm projecting just to that coordinate, the contributions from that, uh, from that particular uh, copy of C2. So if I'm just projecting to that, looking at those elements from that, that um, copy of C2, then it's going to be represented as a point in the block sphere. But, so that's like component-wise or coordinate-wise, but if you have an element, say, Q, some element Q here, which is an, in, a, in the whole Hilbert space, it's not represented by an element in the block sphere. It's like something that's much higher dimensional. So in here, you kind of just break up each individual component, and each of them looks is represented by a block sphere. Mm, let's see. Um, here are two uh, remarks and a question. Uh, in here, due to the quantum, we do have a restriction on the maps that they're unitary, meaning that the complex conjugate of U is the inverse of U, meaning that we have this identity, which means that quantum circuits are reversible, that you can run them in the backwards direction, which is different to what classical circuits um, different from what classical how classical circuits behave. Um, for instance, if you just look at A, the AND gate, you can move in the forward direction, but based on the result of the operation, you cannot go in the backwards uh, direction. You don't know what A and B are based on the result of A and B. So this is something different from classical circuits. And in particular, when we were looking at, at classical circuits, we had that the domain and range are te could technically be different. M and N could be different. But in this case, since we have unitary operators, we must have that the domain and the range must be the same space. And they have to be reversible. And there's ways to actually simulate this and gates by actually keeping track of one of the bits. So uh, you could have a quantum circuit that has something like this. Uh, some quantum circuit A and B, and then it spits out A and B, essentially, and then you keep track of A. So you don't lose all the information, you keep some of the information, and if you have A, and A and B, you can actually go back. So there's ways to work around this uh, constraint of reversibility, but that's something to be aware of that everything must be reversible. And now, similar to a question I posed before, how many quantum circuits or unitary maps C2 to C2 exist? That's a quick question. I'll give you a minute to think about it. All right, I think people are figuring out I have a <laughs> right there. So let's parse this out. I wasn't going to remember this uh, decomposition of a two by two unitary matrix. So I had to write it down and make sure it was there, but I didn't want to give it away. Uh, so for this case, of the quantum circuit, uh, uh, U is gonna be a two by two matrix. And if a unitary two by two matrix, you can actually represent it by 
um, in this format. Mm, let's make it a little bit bigger. And this A and B are complex numbers. And, and I think phi must be real. And phi is, I guess, zero to two pi. But in any case, we have an uncountable number of them because we have all the complex numbers. So this is another contrast with classical circuits that in the classical case, we can really just enumerate all of them. In this case, we can't enumerate all of them. Um, and the idea then is how does the universality result for classical computers translate to quantum computers? Is there a, a basic set of building blocks that can construct any quantum circuit? And the, since, since, the, since there's uncountably many, then the answer is no, because we would need to have uncountably many set of building blocks. But the way to translate or adapt this result is that there is a set of building blocks that can approximate any quantum, any operator U arbitrarily close. So, but then the, the, um, the circuits start getting larger and larger, arbitrarily large. And that's, I believe that's one of the uh, specific um, areas of research in quantum computing, figuring out clever ways to represent specific unitary operators with basic building blocks. And the basic building blocks or the basic gates for the quantum case are this following gates, and these are for one qubit. Um, this is again from the textbook. And they take one qubit and spit out another qubit and they're represented by this unitary matrices and this symbols. And and in here you actually see the poly matrices, the spin operators that we already talked about. These are these are the X Y C gates. These are going to be some of the basic building blocks to uh, build or approximate any unitary operator arbitrarily close. And uh, then there's also these control gates to have in mind that are represented by this unitary gate and then this uh, line and dot above, which in here you have this, the input here is this T qubit and this C qubit, and the output is going to be the C qubit and this uc t qubit. And what this means is that you input these two qubits, and if c is equal to one, then you're gonna have u to the, c, u to the one, and this gate is going to uh, act on this qubit. And if c is equal to zero, then it's gonna be u to a zero, then that's gonna be the identity, and it's not gonna act on this T. So the way that I think about it, it's kind of like plugging in your toaster. If it's plugged in and you try to use it, it's gonna work. If it's not plugged in and you try to use it, nothing's gonna happen. So this C gate is controlling whether the function happens or not. And that makes it reversible. And one specific example is this control not gate which if it's plugged in, then you're gonna flip the bits, the qubits, and if it's not plugged in, then it's gonna remain identity. So these are gonna be control gates. And just to wrap up, in theory, if you were paying a lot, really close attention, you can see I have Hadamard gates, the plus are going to be the, uh, I think it's, these are X gates, really, and then this, the lines with the dots, these are controlled gates, 
And you can technically see how what each of the elements are going on here, and then there's some representation of the, I'm not quite sure about the Q sphere, but it's supposed to be mimicking this block sphere. So technically, you should be able to follow what's going on here, roughly, maybe with a little bit more practice. Um, but that's it. Uh, being the lookout, I'll send some uh, assignments.